Good morning, church. It's good to see your smiling faces again. I want to thank Pastor Trevin for filling the pulpit for the past couple weeks. Susie and I were away on our 40th wedding anniversary. And forever, yeah. I said, it feels like yesterday. She said, it seems like 400 years ago. <laughs> it's all about perspective. She'd been wanting forever to go to Alaska, and I kept telling her it was for old people, and she said, we are the old people. <laughs> so I started looking for cruises, and there's a lot of different choices you have, and um, from a financial standpoint, the, the boat in the upper left look attractive, <laughs> but 40 years of marriage has taught me one thing, that the bottom right corner was the right decision. You know, and, and, and we got on this boat, and we're learning about it, and they're, they're amazing structures, these cruise ships, right? And, we found out that this cruise ship generated enough electric power to power a small city. It could, it could power literally this entire area that we're in off this little cruise ship. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, man, wouldn't it be terrible if we lost power? We would be on that little boat up there, right? But 300, 400 years ago, people weren't concerned about losing power because they didn't have power, right? Isn't it interesting how, once we've seen what power can do for our life, how we become so addicted to it, so dependent on it? I mean, one of the things I was worried about when we were out on this was that the battery power on my phone was going to die, and I wasn't going to take my pictures. I know for the youth, it would be the end of your day, just go home, go to bed, we're done, right? If our phone batteries die on us. And the reality is we do everything we can to avoid losing power, Right? You lost some power here, I think, with one of the storms. Some of you did. It's a miserable experience to be without power in life. And so we go to great lengths. We, we, we put generators in our homes. You know, we call the power companies to make sure that that power supply is not going to disrupt our lives because we're so dependent on it in life. And this can be the same for us spiritually as well. As we come to understand the power that we have access to through the Holy Spirit and what he provides us for life, the more we're going to see God revealed in our lives in new and powerful ways and the more that we're going to want our life to revolve around the power of the Holy Spirit. Over the coming weeks as we wrap up our summer series, God's Word is going to reveal and remind us of the power that we have living within us the Holy Spirit, and what a spirit-powered life means to us and means to us being used for God's kingdom. So as we prepare to hear from his word, I want you to take a moment, thank God for the power he's given you in the Holy Spirit this morning. God, we know you as the creator of all that is, of heaven and earth, of, of everything that walks and moves upon the earth, God. And we think of the power that it would take to be the mighty God that you are and to consider and to contemplate that that power lives within us because of our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, is almost too much for us to comprehend, but it's the reality, God, that we have through our faith in him. Our prayer this morning, God, is that as you reveal your power within us, that it would be something which would encourage us in life. It would, it would um, just move us forward in life to be used by you in ever more powerful ways as a testimony to the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, that you want us to bring to this fallen, broken world. So we give this time to you, God. We give you our worship and praise and honor and glory. And we just give you thanks and praise for your Holy Spirit who we seek this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the fact of the matter is we've become reluctant in the church today to talk about the Holy Spirit, haven't we? We don't hear him talked about too much, maybe occasionally here and there. And for whatever the reason, we might not talk so much about the Holy Spirit, we'll, we'll, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the message. The fact of the matter is in the early church, we see the Holy Spirit front and center. The early church understood who the Holy Spirit was to them, what the Holy Spirit brought to them. 
And that's what God wants to impart to us this morning. He wants us to understand as we leave this morning is who it is that lives within us through our faith in Christ. So we're going to start in, in Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at a couple of verses this morning. This is Luke's second volume of his testimony and witness as to the life of Christ in the early church. He begins in Acts 1, verse 1, writing, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Now, one of the things I want us to understand as we're going through this study over the next several weeks is that the Holy Spirit is God himself, just as Jesus the Son is God himself, and God the Father is God himself. And just like God the Father and God the Son, the Holy Spirit also is his own person within the Trinity. And we talked several weeks ago when we started this. We don't fully comprehend how there's three persons in one God. We'll, we'll, we'll understand that on this other side of, of heaven. But it's the fact, it's the reality that Scripture testifies to from the Old Testament all the way through Revelation. And while Jesus is God with us, God in the flesh, we could say that the Holy Spirit is God in us. God living within you and me through our faith in Christ at this very moment. And recognizing the Holy Spirit's presence in and over our lives is going to be directly related to the power in which we live for Christ in this life. Think about what's described in our passage this morning. In verse 2, it says, Jesus began to, uh, he wrote about what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. Now, it's rather interesting when we go back and look at the fourth chapter of Luke. Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. And at the, towards the latter part of his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus, right, in the form of a dove. And then in chapter 4, it's when he's going into the wilderness to be tempted. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. And we go down to verse 14... It says, and Jesus returned from the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an integral part of knowing our God. It was the Spirit's power, it was the Spirit's leading, it was the Spirit's guiding that Jesus accessed while he was here on this earth. And what we see is of every instance that we see that God the Spirit, God the Son, God the Father are talked about, they're all working together. They're not working their own agendas. They're not working their own plans. They're not working their own good ideas apart from one another. They're always in complete unity and harmony in how they work together, how God intends to use them together to reveal himself, to express himself to his creation. And then we go down to verse 4. And this is rather interesting because it said that Jesus gave his disciples a command. 
He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, this might be hard to, to imagine, but, but just think with me for a minute. If you had seen Jesus raised from the dead, okay, if you had just had fish with Jesus, and then you just see him ascend to heaven on a cloud and disappear from your sight, would that get you a little excited? Wouldn't you want to tell somebody about what you just witnessed? I mean, when you think about the mission of the church was, was to declare and give a testimony about Jesus Christ, could there be anyone more excited, more excited than coming back from conference, more excited from the week that the middle school spent down at, at their camp, more excited of you coming out of a, of a Bible study, of a, of a personal study, of, a, of the, the best preaching you've ever heard, more excited than that. Can you imagine what they must have been feeling? And, and that would have been the time to send them out to tell people about Jesus. And Jesus says, wait. I know you're excited. I know this is a big deal. Wait. And in verse 8, the reason you wanted them to wait, it says it's because they're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on them, then they're going to be his witnesses, Jesus' witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He wanted them to take the message to the ends of the earth. But what he was doing, what he was telling them, what he was saying to them was, you are powerless to take that message anywhere until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't care how excited you are. I don't care uh, uh, just how, how, you know, you're looking at this situation and, and you just can't wait to express it to other people. You might be. What Jesus knew is that they were going to face opposition the minute they took his message to the world. You and I can't stand against Satan apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, apart from God's power in us. But because of that power in us, John, 1 John 1 says, greater is the one in you, the Holy Spirit, than the one that's in the world. So Jesus is saying, wait for this power because he knew that they weren't going to be able to, to stand up to the attacks of Satan when he came after them as they're declaring who he was, what he'd done, where he'd gone. He also knew that they wouldn't, would not be able to stand up to the persecution that the world was going to bring to them. You and I begin to fold the minute the world presses in on us. We begin to lose our minds the minute people start belittling us, mocking us. We want to shy away. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can stand up to those persecutions. We can stand up to those that want to push us down and discourage us in life. Jesus knew that they needed the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome their sin nature. That nature that's been enslaving you from the moment you and I take our first breath and that we try to break those bonds. And Jesus knew you can't break those bonds on your own because if you could do that, I wouldn't have needed to come. The whole reason I came is because you can't overcome sin on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to be my testimony, to be living in the holiness that I call you to as a living testimony to me. And the truth of the matter is, church, nothing's changed today. You and I cannot do this life for Christ in our own power. I don't care how great our ideas are. I don't care how passionate our, our intentions are and wanting to be used by God, wanting to reveal God, wanting to do for God. You and I are incapable, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, of doing anything for God. That's why the early church was told you have to wait for that power, and it's why it's so important for us to recognize that, that, that we have that power, that we need that power, that we should be accessing that power. So often we gather as churches, and, or, or we do life as believers, and, and we just feel like we're constantly being defeated, we're constantly being beat down, we constantly can't overcome the things that the world is throwing at us. We just feel lifeless, we feel 
we feel dread, it's because we're not living in the power that God has given us with his Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit is present, you see life, you see joy, you see excitement, you see passion, you see purpose. That's what God has provided us in the Holy Spirit. Paul reminded the Ephesians, we're born dead in our trespasses and sins. And that presents a very big problem for mankind. Because sin has caused us to be separated from God and we're born spiritually dead, we don't even know we have a need for Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul told the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, he said, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. His second letter, he says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. As we lament the world, as we look at the world around us and we see the darkness around us and, and, and it, it angers us and it frustrates us and it creates anxiety for us, God's desire is not that we would be praying for him to take them out of the scene. He wants us to recognize he's the re they're the reason Jesus came and it's the reason we need the Holy Spirit because only the Holy Spirit can open their eyes to their need for Jesus Christ. When you and I are born, we didn't even know we needed to restore our relationship with God, to restore our access to God's power. We didn't even know there was a power that we needed. You and I come into this life thinking that we only have to rely on ourselves, right? Stand on our own two feet, make our own way through life in the world. Parents, how many of you want your kids to live with you forever? Show of hands. <laughs> we love you guys. And when you leave home, we're happy for you to come and we're happy for you to leave. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask how many kids want to live with their parents forever because I know there's not many hands at that either. But the point is this, is that we get this idea that we're meant to do life in our own power, meant to, meant to stand on our own two feet in life. And, and when that is, gets into the context of, of the spiritual realm, we're just like the people who lived 300 years ago who didn't know what electricity was. They were, didn't wake up and go, oh, power's out again. They didn't know what power was. When you and I are born, we don't know what the power of God is. We can't comprehend it because we're spiritually dead. So that really does create a problem for us, right? And praise God, he solved our problem for us once again. You see, the Holy Spirit is who gives us new life. In John 6, 63, Jesus is addressing the group of people who he had fed with bread and fish the day before and who followed him to the next day and wanted more bread and fish. He said, no, you're, you're just here for the food. I'm the bread of life. I'm here to lead you to me. And as part of his explaining why he came and, and what he offered, he says this in verse 663, he says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. This flesh that you and I inhabit is temporary. It's going away. It's all going to come to an end at some point. But this life that we have in Jesus is eternal. It is never ending. And Paul said in Romans 8, 11, he said, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. It's the Holy Spirit who brings us into this relationship with Jesus Christ. And in John 16, 8, um, Jesus explains to his disciples, he said, when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. The role of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to you and to reveal to me the thing that we don't even know we're missing, which is a relationship with God. It's to reveal to you and to reveal to me that there is this thing that has separated me from having a relationship with God, which is my sin. The role of the Holy Spirit is to explain to you and to explain to me that the path back to a relationship with God is through our faith in Jesus Christ, 
who's paid the penalty for our sins which separated us from our God. The Holy Spirit is essential to who we are in Christ and why we are here this morning. You and I had nothing to do with our coming to faith in Christ because we didn't know we needed faith in Christ. And God was, had a reason for that because he didn't want us to think we would have anything to do with restoring our relationship with him. That's the, way that, that's the reason that the work of God is from beginning to end God's work through the Holy Spirit, through his son Jesus Christ, through God's plan that he's had in place for eternity. The Holy Spirit is who gives us the ability to recognize religion doesn't get us into heaven. Following rules doesn't get us into heaven. Being part of a church, coming to every sermon, every service that we have, to every meeting that we have, to every event that we have, to every study that we have, doesn't get us into heaven. Being the best person that's ever lived in this earth, giving away everything you own, spending your whole life working for the needs of the lowliest of the low, doesn't get us into heaven. It's the Holy Spirit opening our eyes to our need for a Savior that brings us to place our faith in Jesus Christ that gets us into God's eternal kingdom. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing. That's how significant his role is in our life. He gives us, he brings us to new life in Christ. The Holy Spirit guides us through life. John told his disciples, I mean, Jesus told his disciples in John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So I'll, I came to faith a little bit older. I was 20-something years old. I'd grown up in the church. I knew a lot of things about God. I knew a lot of things about Jesus. I had had a Bible. I had, I had read a Bible. But I never comprehended it, never connected with me that it was about a relationship with Jesus Christ is what all this was about. I, I never comprehended that. I thought just knowing was enough. But I will tell you, in terms of how the, the this Holy Spirit works in your life, when the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to my need for a relationship, for a confession of my sins, for my personally placing my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior, when I went back and opened up the Bible, things that I, I just can't tell you I had ever understood, it all made sense. And it made sense not because I had become overnight smarter. It made sense because the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to the truth of God. And he continues to do that this day. He guides us through life. The Holy Spirit is who helps you discern right from wrong. Who helps you discern you know, the, the paths that God has set for us versus the ones we want to set for ourselves. He's the one that is out there going before you each and every day, opening your eyes to where God would have us go and how he would have us move and what he would have us speak in the truth of God. And he's not only giving us life and guiding us through life, but it, in Ephesians, Paul reminded the Ephesians in Ephesians 1.13 that you were, when you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When he used this word, marked with a seal, the, the Ephesians immediately knew what Jesus was talking about, that we're, we're guarded in the Holy Spirit. You see, the king's seal on a document in their day, when that king's seal was on something, it could not be revoked, it could not be countermanded, it could not be challenged, it could not be overcome. That's what happens when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and he seals us. Nothing can get to us. Nothing can separate us, Paul told the Romans in Romans 8, 38 and 39, from the love of God forevermore. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul goes on in verse 14 of that first chapter of Ephesians that he said, the promised Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Jesus said, no one can snatch you from my hand. No one can snatch you from my Father's hand. No one can separate us from the love of God, Paul tells us, because the Holy Spirit is our seal. He's our guard. He's our guarantee. 
no matter how difficult things get in life, no matter how much we feel like the world is oppressing the church and persecuting the church and dispersing the church and you know, pushing the church into the shadows, that world cannot prevail. The enemy cannot prevail. Sin does not prevail because the Holy Spirit has guaranteed our eternal inheritance. That's the hope that we live this life with. No matter what we're facing in life, no matter the financial crisis, the relationship crisis, the, 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 the health crises that we face, whatever this world throws at us, our assurance is that true life, real life, eternal life, perfect life is assured because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. We can trust that. That's our guarantee. And this last one, and this isn't intended to be exhausted this morning by any means, but this last thing to consider is the Holy Spirit is God in us for all of life. Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter how long we've been a follower of Jesus. The minute you've placed your faith in him, the Holy Spirit came to live within you and is dwelling within each and every one of us this very moment, this very morning. We're talking about God, the creator of all things. We're talking about God whose power you and I can't comprehend. We're talking about God who is eternal, is living in each one of us. Do you go out throughout your day thinking about that? Does it cross your mind? God's not just with us as in Jesus came and walked the earth. God is in us. He's with me every breath of every day wherever I am. He knows what I'm going through. He knows what I'm struggling with. He knows what my needs are. And he has the power to bring about whatever he needs for my life. Are we living with a comprehension and and a desire to be living in that power as we go throughout life. You know, we should be the most joyful people on the face of God's creation, no matter the circumstance. And I don't mean joy as in the sense of, oh, we're happy that we're struggling or, or we're suffering or we're... I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the joy that gives us that quiet peace and assurance that no matter what we're facing, it can't overcome us. Because Jesus is our Savior, God is our Father, and the Holy Spirit is our guide and our guard. He's our God in us. This is who the Holy Spirit is to us, church. It's probably the least utilized, resourced thing that God has given us through our faith in Jesus Christ, and it's right here in each and every one of us this morning. We should never feel defeated by the world. Politics, politicians, institutions can't take down the church, can't do anything to us in our faith. They can make life more difficult here in this world. They can make things uncomfortable for us in this world, but they can't separate us from our God. They can't change the fact we have our eternal salvation laid up in heaven. They can't change the fact that all this is coming to an end anyway, whatever we have. So if the Holy Spirit is so critical to our life with Christ and our worship of God, it does beg the question, why are we so reluctant to seek the Holy Spirit in our life or in the life of our church? Now we could probably do weeks just on this, but let me just give you a suggestion of, of three very general reasons. Um, Francis Chan reflected on these in his book, Forgotten God, that he wrote many years ago, and I just thought it was, it was well-reasoned. He suggests, and, and I agree with this, that one of the reasons why we probably don't seek the power as frequently and as often and as regularly as we should is because we fear God might not show up. Have you ever been reluctant in that prayer to ask God for the big thing, the miraculous thing, the thing that we know can't happen because, well, God is just going to lead to disappointment. I've found myself there before. God, I don't want to ask you, I know this isn't realistic, and I know this isn't 
you know, in, in real life going to happen. I'm not going to burden you with it. So let's go with this little bit smaller thing. It's almost like we're compensating for God. God, we don't want you to fail in front of our friends and our family when we tell them we've asked for this big thing and then you don't do it. A second reason he suggests, the first being we fear God might not show up, is that we fear God will show up. Well, why do we fear God will show up? Because you and I know if God shows up, where he's going to start with is Dario, a few things we need to get off your table here. We need this to go, we need this to go, we need this to go, we need this to go. Seeking the power of the Holy Spirit is like putting, doing a yard sale for me, right? If I, if I agree to do a yard sale, I know all my stuff's going to be in the yard. I'm happy for you guys to do your yard sales, just don't bring it to my address. We can't expect to pursue the Holy Spirit without expecting him to change you and change me. It's part of what he does in us. He conforms us to the image of Christ. He transforms our mind to the mind of Christ. He's constantly working in this what we call sanctification process, having us become more Christ-like throughout our life that's never finished in this life, but, but we're always seeking to become more like him. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in us, revealing God's truth for us, convicting us of, God's sin, uh, of the world and sin in us, and, and showing us the things that need to be moved off our plate, which is why... The first time we, we're, we're reluctant God won't show up and we don't want to disappoint anybody. The second one is we're afraid he will show up and he's going to call me first and foremost to have to change. And that might be uncomfortable. And a third reason might be that we fear what others might think of us. If we start talking about the power of the Holy Spirit in us, they're going to think that we're one of those over-the-top religious people, Right? We're more concerned about the world thinks of us and what the word reveals about the power within us. Church, we need to be living in this power, seeking this power, desiring this power, passionate for his power, because it's there. It's not something we have to like plead and beg for him to give us. It's already here. It's just taking our lives and, tr and trusting them to God to live in that power he's already given us. And I promise you this, it will transform you, it will transform us, it will transform me as we seek to do that more and more. I can't tell you, staff can, they probably can't tell you, it's been too many times. I've come up with super great ideas and invited God to join me. And it doesn't go well. God says, seek me, seek my power, seek my way, seek my leading, seek my guiding, seek my guarding, seek my protection, and watch what he does. And I will tell you guys, I mean, it's hard to even explain. I've seen it, I've lived it, I've experienced it. It's real. It's real. And it's readily available to every single one of us. God's word, Jesus' own words made clear. The Holy Spirit is our key to doing life in Christ and to living life for Christ. We cannot avoid acknowledging the Holy Spirit, seeking the Holy Spirit, and praising God for the Holy Spirit if we want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. From beginning to end, our journey is God-empowered, God-enabled, and God-provided. If you're here this morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, what is God saying to you this morning? What are you hearing from his word? What is the Holy Spirit revealing to you about what God is offering you through your faith in Jesus Christ, the eternal salvation he offers in Jesus Christ? Invite him to reveal himself to you this morning, to place your faith in Christ. Church, how might God be speaking to you right now? What area of your life is he saying he wants to use his power in? that maybe you haven't turned over to him? What is it he wants to reveal to you? We came into this world powerless, but praise God, because of his grace and mercy, through the death of his son and the work of his Holy Spirit, we have the power of God within us. Join me in prayer.
God is incomprehensible. To consider you living within us, to consider the power of your Holy Spirit is available to us. And the enemy is constantly trying to blind our minds as believers to believing the lie, God, that there are things in this world that you cannot overcome. That there are things in this world that we're left to do on our own. So I just pray, God, that as you work in the life of your church here at Calvary Grace, God, that you would remove those false beliefs from us, God. That you would have us turning to you to seek to live individually and, and corporately in your power, God. That you would reveal yourself in ever more um, magnified ways through us to this community as they see your power at work within us. That all points to the sacrifice of your son and the offer of eternal salvation in him that we want the world to know. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.